I'm here with my friend and colleague, Gerald McBurney, who has put together the libretto and the storyline for the creatures of Prometheus by Beethoven. And we are here to discuss the origins and the meaning of all this. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you. It's a great privilege to be involved with this because although it's a rather famous piece by Beethoven, it's actually not performed very often. So it's very exciting that you're doing it with the Philharmonia Orchestra. And when the music is done, usually the audience has no idea what the storyline is. So it's a lot of fun to take advantage of this occasion to try and support people's pleasure in this score by giving them a sense of where we are in the story at every point. There's something extraordinary about the chance that took Beethoven to writing this piece. Obviously, it was an imperial commission, but the date of the first performance had already been fixed by the time he was asked to do it. And he had two weeks to write the score. And Vigano, who it's was- It's like a normal Hollywood composer schedule. Yeah. You know, here's the film, <laughs> write the music. Yes. So it was, it was a very practical thing. It was his first big commission from the imperial family. It, it then feeds into the rest of his career in a strange way, this work. And I, I think part of it has to do with, with the fact that it was a huge success. It does seem that part of the point of it was to lure to Vienna two or three of the most popular dancers in Europe at the time. And they chose as the choreographer a man called Viganò, who was actually a composer and also the nephew of the world-famous composer Boccherini. When people discover that Beethoven wrote a ballet, they tend to get the wrong idea because ballet suggests tutus and Swan Lake and Nutcracker and that sort of thing. And ballet in Beethoven's day was something completely different and I think very remote from our experience. The ballets that were made in Mozart and Beethoven's time tended to be story ballets. They were a bit like pantomimes, really. The, technical name for them was ballet d'action, a ballet of action. The story of the creatures of Prometheus is really a dog's dinner. And the point of the story was to incorporate as much spectacle and fun as possible. At any rate, the story is very simple in one way. It's the story of somebody, a divine being, who creates two human beings, but they're not really human. So the problem then becomes, how do I make these two clay figures human? And the answer is, well, I've got to make them posh, haven't I? I've got to educate them. So I've got to introduce them to music and dancing and military parades, and tragedy and comedy, so I've got to take them to the theatre. So it's quite a poignant story for lockdown, really, when all these things are closed. If you look at the Beethoven sketches, they're absolutely filled with notes, staging notes and plot notes, particularly around the bits where Prometheus at the beginning is struggling to make these two creatures live. And I find that fantastically moving because it's as though Beethoven's writing about himself. He's writing about the problem of how to be an artist. I've had an idea to write a piece, but how do I make it work? As you said, the, the clay figures, they, they are trying to learn, learn to walk. And in this process, they ignore their creator, Prometheus, which annoys him to, to no, no end. And he was not always that tragic figure who sacrificed his life, or, or at least his, his well-being and his health for, for mankind or humankind, but, but he was also this trickster figure. 
in many traditions. Prometheus is the trickster. He's, he's, he's like Lorge in, in, the, in the ring, the guy who stole the fire and, and uses it. But he's generally a little shifty, not to be trusted. If we go really far back in, in terms of the, the origins, origins of the, the myth, of the Vedic tradition and so on, so, so we are definitely talking about the trickster. The tragic hero Prometheus is maybe a, a, a later product. It's clear from the music itself that Beethoven is completely delighted with the comedic aspects of this story. Absolutely, and, and also it gives him the perfect excuse to contrast the old with the new. And I, 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 I really enjoy that aspect a lot. When the clay people are finally fully formed, as humans. They do a solo dance, both of them, and they both start from a very old form, a gavotte or, or an, a, a, a slow minuet. And then after a while, quite soon, they, they get tired of it. Okay, not, that's, that's boring, let's do something modern. And in this case, modern is, is a contredance and a lendler. And that contrast and that dynamic is I, I'm sure he enjoyed that really much, very much. He had just completed the first symphony, which is, of course, reflected in the fact that the style of the overture is very close to, um, to the in, symphony. In fact, the first chords <laughs> yes. are identical to those of the introduction of the, of the first symphony, because it, it seemed to be working first time round. Why, why not to do it again? That's how composers think. What I find absolutely fascina fascinating about this score is that, that he's, it's like a lab. Yeah. He's testing his material. He's testing harmonic and textural and melodic ideas, which he uses later on, much later in some cases. I mean, there are moments when, when he's very clearly testing the, the climax point of the finale of the second symphony, almost at pitch uh, and using the very same notes and so on. And there, there's even a moment that makes me think of the ninth symphony. And that's the moment when the clay figures finally understand from the gods and the, all the other celebs that they have become human or almost human because of, of their uh, influence. So they thank them and at the end of that number they throw themselves onto the floor in front of Prometheus, their creator. And that moment is almost completely identical with, with a few moments in the first movement of the Ninth Symphony. And it cannot be a coincidence but the musical connection is very strong. He tests, tries out certain things that end up in the, the Sixth Symphony, the, the pastoral yeah. writing. The, the flowing water and yeah, the, the birds. The and symbols, the, mm. uh, uh, and also the use of the bassoon. In a less uh, uh, precise way, but as, as an idea, he also tries out the slow movement of the fourth piano concerto, the, the idea of the, the godlike and uh, human-like. So that is in the, the score of Prometheus already. One of the fascinating aspects of this score is that he makes it hang together by very deft use of musical ideas, the central musical idea of this rhythm of the clay figures, which he doesn't use it like uh, Wagner would all the way through, but from time to time, he beautifully reminds us of the awkward walking of the clay figures.
And there's a second aspect to the way he makes this score hang together, which is that he uses the instruments as symbols, particularly the wind instruments, the harp, of course. The one and only harp part <laughs> by Beethoven yeah. ever. Beautiful harp Yes, part. absolutely stunning. And he uses that to represent Apollo. He uses the clarinet and the bassoon to represent the male, the female and the male clay figures and the oboe to represent the muse of tragedy, and the flute to represent the muse of poetry. There's something very beautiful about that. It's very simple, very theatrical, and very easy to follow, and pleasurable too, because of the way he writes for those solo instruments. This finale of the ballet, which is the one bit that most modern listeners will recognize because they'll recognize the tune as the tune of the last movement of the Eroica Symphony, of the Third Symphony, and also of a very, very famous set of piano variations which was written before the symphony. It's the fulcrum or the arrival point of the plot. The gods, the celebs, as you call them, teach the two clay figures how to be human, how to dance, how to enjoy the theater, how to go for a walk in the countryside, all these things. And once the two, the, the male and the female figures have showed off their skills in the two solos near the end, they lead the celebration. The male and female say, Okay, boys, it's our turn now. You're going to follow us. It's essentially the same music that we heard at the beginning when the two clay figures were trying to move when they stand up, but they can't move. They're moving like characters from a, from a claymation animation. I find that moment really touching. And it, it's also funny because it, the clay figures are moving for the first time and nothing makes sense and there's no continuity and then there are these moments when they the music for a second becomes quite tender so it, it, instead of going tom tim tom then it goes like di, di, di. Well, and so the, it, it's it's very touching and and prometheus is trying to communicate with them by dancing a contradance, right? Again, and they just ignore him. The script says that the, the clay figures are staring at the tree. It's like waiting for God or yeah, something. Yeah, I was just thinking <laughs> about the, like a Beckett moment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's this dancer who is, who is dancing this contradance very, very actively and demonstratively, trying to <laughs> catch their uh, attention. And, and they're just, what looking at the tree. There's something very delicious about that image. Mm -hmm. 